for joining me today. Uh, my name is Christine Minato and I'm the Executive Director for the UCSF Rosamund Institute. And today we are very, very excited to have Neil uh, Dispirito uh, joining us uh, to share with you his insight. Um, and uh, let's start with uh, an introduction because uh, uh, Neil has a lot to cover. And I want to make sure that he has all the time that he needs uh, to share his story. Uh, joining us today as well is Adam Schoen. He is a partner at uh, Brown and Rutnick. Uh, I don't know if you hear a lot about Brown and Rutnick besides uh, in this uh, healthcare field. Uh, I was uh, sending email to Adam early this week when I just learned about the whole Johnny Depp uh, uh, lawsuit. And I was like, Brown and Rutnick is representing Johnny Depp. So I thought that was really fun, like my, my little celebrity connection. So that's why I was excited to send an email to Adam about it. So a little bit of background about Adam. Adam is have a lot of experience in the IP and he's uh, our friends and our partners uh, from Brown and Rutnick. And Adam will be uh, uh, helping us moderating uh, the question today. Uh, so if you have any question for Neil, please uh, feel free to uh, put it in the Q&A box right there. Um, and uh, Neil will answer the question along the way with, uh, with his talk. So that's uh, Adam. And, um, but yes. And so I'd like to introduce you to Neil. And uh, like I said, Neil has been in an industry for 30 years plus, and he has a lot of experience. Uh, he has uh, his perspective on, on the FDA. It will be really interesting. And he's been at a private practice as well for, uh, for the last 18 years. He's going to share not only his perspective, but you know the cases that he had dealt with, the deals and the, recent, the approval. And he's going to touch on a lot about you know where what are the issues and the challenges are in getting your new product into the market. And so I'm looking forward to hear a lot of the anecdotes and the stories that Neil has experienced. So a bit of background on uh, Neil is that he is not only that he has a lot of experience in the devices and health, but he's also have a lot of experience in the pharmaceutical and biologic. He, before, uh, before he was in the private practice, um, he has done uh, work in the pharmaceutical and he also teaches, uh, which is, I think is really exciting um, that he is doing that. And Neil is also serve as the chair of the regulatory committee and the Florida Medical Device Manufacturing Consortium. So that's another thing that he has uh, on top of many other amazing things that he has done in the past. And Neil joined Brown and Rutnick uh, early last year. Is it early last year? Uh, and before that, he was a partner at Epstein Becker Green, uh, where he was a member of Life Science and Technology and Healthcare Group. And so, and like I said, before he'd become a law, uh, an attorney, he worked for a major pharma company uh, in the US, EU, Asia, Pacific, Latin America. In, you know, he covered everything from marketing, manufacturing, advertising, FDA regulatory. So it's, he has a wealth of experience and I'm looking forward to hear his perspective. And with that, Neil. Thank you, Christine, for that kind introduction. That was very nice of you. I appreciate it. And thank you, Adam, for inviting me to be here as well. Um, we're going to get started today, and one of the things that I want to emphasize is please ask your questions as we go. Um, I think it makes for a more interesting presentation, and I think it gives us gives me a chance to focus my comments to the audience. Uh, I'm sure there are many different levels of knowledge out there and experience, and it, it, asking questions makes it easier for me to figure out where the audience um, interests lie and also where the audience knowledge lies and we can then tailor the presentation a little bit more to what your needs are. Okay, um, I'd like to get started. I've spent 30 plus years in this industry, uh, 18 of them in private practice, practicing in FDA law and medical devices, uh, pharmaceuticals, biologics, and these days a lot of uh, mobile apps and medical software. So those are uh, things I'm going to talk to you about today. 
And one of the things I think where we should start is obviously on the objectives. And I'm going to move my screen forward. Um, what we see is in bringing your drug to market, we're going to understand the medical device digital health process as best we can in the next hour. I mean, these topics, pretty much we could all write a book on. Um, I wrote a book called Bringing Your Product to Market. It's 828 pages. So obviously we don't have that kind of time. So we're gonna keep this at a higher level and more targeted to where your interests are. We're gonna explore the laws that control medical devices, digital health products. We're gonna examine the regulations that apply to medical devices and digital health products. And I'm gonna to try to give you some strategic tips for approval and managing your product beyond approval. So as we move on to the next slide, the first thing to understand is the FDA is not one organization. It is many organizations under one roof. And in medical apps and in the um, medical device arena, you're gonna be dealing with the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health. I'll mention the other two centers, uh, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, or CEDAR, which is the largest of the three centers. That's kind of the aircraft carrier or battleship of the fleet. Um, and then the smaller centers, which are not small, but smaller than CEDAR, certainly the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, uh, which is headed by Dr. Peter Marks, who I speak with often and the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health, which is headed by Dr. Jeff Shoren, uh, who I speak with off, often. And Jeff is a lawyer and a doctor, so um, he's an interesting individual. The Center for Drug uh, Evaluation Research is headed by um, someone I've probably known for oh, 20 of my 30 years, or maybe 25 of my 30 years, uh, Dr. Janet Woodcock. Um, she's also now acting as the interim director of the agency, or was until uh, Dr. Uh, Bob Califf, uh, Rob Califf, uh, came on board again for the second tour. So the Center for Devices and Radiological Health is who you will be dealing with in devices and mobile apps and software, okay? The devices to start with are governed under something called 21 Code of Federal Regulations 800. And it's all the sections of 800 that, um, that guide those. 600 guides the biologics, 200 guides the drugs, and 100 guides the foods. So just a little bit of background information as we move forward on that. And then there's you, really- Before you move forward, can you just sure. clarify for one of our um one of the one of the participants again which one covers small molecules small molecules are covered by cedar Perfect. the center for drug evaluation great thank you the largest of the three centers thank you um so as we move to the next slide uh there are three ways you need a pre-market authorization or approval generally referred to as a pma in in the um parlance of this in the jargon of the industry. And that's gonna be a new device. You don't have something called a predicate device. And let me just take a minute and go over predicate devices. Predicate devices are basically devices that exist that are similar enough to your product that you can file something called a 510K. Uh, it's kind of like a making a photocopy, okay? so. You know, in essence, when you have a new device that's implantable or that's of um, a greater, uh, a level three device, and we'll go over to level shortly, you're going to end up in something called a PMA. And while a PMA is great, it gives you a lot of protection um, from your uh, competitors and things for being the first one in the market. What it also does is require clinical trials and also requires um, a lot of money. There's a lot of cost in getting to market. It's generally an 18 to 24 month experience and you have to produce a lot of data uh, because there's nothing out there that is comparable to this product. The next one is the 510K and that has something called the predicate device. 
So if you create a particular heart monitor and it works on the same engineering principle as another heart monitor, even though it enhances it and does it better, then you are able to use the other one as a predicate device. And by using it as a predicate device, it's a shortcut to your filing and approval. And generally the 510K is considered a notice. So you file it and then you wait uh, 90 to 180 days. And it, without comment from FDA, you can proceed uh, using the device at risk if you don't hear from them. Most of the time you hear from them that, you know, your notice is accepted and you're authorized to put it on. But it's not an approval. It's a notice and authorization and it's a shorter route. So for those of you who are getting into the business, smaller companies, um, newer companies, uh, people with a new idea. If you find products that uh, are out there that you can improve upon and create something called a 510K in order to shorten your filing process and limit your costs, for a new company, that's the strategy you want to use. You wanna go forward with that um, in order to save time and money. Adam, you've reappeared on the screen. I, I think there's a question. Of course, because it's an interesting topic. And uh, I think you, you've already stimulated thoughts from people. And this one relates to, I think at the highest level, when is it best to engage FDA for their guidance, such as at this stage, whether it's 510K or de novo or PMA, is that something you should already be trying to engage FDA on to get an understanding of, or is that something done elsewhere through consultants or service providers? Okay, here is, I think, what veteran um, FDA attorneys and veteran FDA consultants who, you know, were formerly with the FDA and things will tell you, we don't want to ask FDA these questions because FDA doesn't want to answer them. You are the expert in your product. They're the expert in their regulations, okay? Now, you can get some guidance from them, but you're much better off going to a, an FDA attorney and an F, uh, you know, who works with an FDA consultant or vice versa first, because we're gonna be able to tell you where your product falls in this whether you're gonna be a PMA, a 510K or a de novo. If you go to the agency, they will generally pick the highest category. So you definitely don't want that. You know, working on products, uh, I've worked on products in the past where the product was different enough from a predicate device that we can't quite use a 510K, okay? So say it's a type of test, but say instead of the standard test, you know, instead of using, uh, a latex test, we're using an antigen test, okay? It's close enough, but it's not a 510K, okay? So what are we going to do? It, previously, in the old days, you had to file a 510, have it rejected, and then go back to a de novo. Today, you can file the de novo right away. And of course, in the Latin, you know, it means brand new, fresh start, de novo. Um, you, you don't have a predicate device, but you don't require a PMA. So you can bring into the meetings with FDA and the hearings, the similarities of other devices that are out there. You can piggyback on some of their data if you have permission to do so. And that's a whole separate story. Adam will talk to you about patents and IP on another occasion, I'm sure. But, you know, if you, if you have permission, to piggyback on that data or the data is publicly available or you know the FDA is willing to share the data with you because it's off patent or you know whatever legal reasons they have then you can use that as much as possible and bring in your new data and that's a de novo and that one is running you know you're running more about six months instead of 18 to 24 months Sometimes it's a little longer because they will require clinical trials. Recently, you saw a lot in the news about the COVID tests and the home COVID tests. Well, in order to bring those to market, the FDA during the 
the worst part of COVID, put out a guidance saying, we can't go through each one of these individually. We don't have time for the full, full process. So we're going to use an emergency authorization or what's called an EUA. And using the emergency authorization, they put out a guidance that says you have to have 30 positive patients and 30 negative patients. So you have to do this trial. That grants you an EUA. The only other part of being granted an EUA is that you have to agree to continue to get the, the product fully approved or authorized as a 510K, as a PMA in a de novo process. So you've got to finish the process. You can't just get the EUA and start it. And then six months later, you haven't done anything because the FDA will take you off the market. So those were the three ways about bringing your product to market. And is there, um, a, there's one other question that sort of dovetails exactly on what you were just touching on, which is in the context of 510Ks, is there a bright line, line rule around the amount of data or a requirement for data in a 510K, such as do they all need clinical data? Can you file a 510K without clinical data? No, they don't all need clinical data. If you're doing a 510K on something um, that's a medical device that has been used for years and it's almost an exact copy, uh, it would be foolish to do that. Sometimes you'll use catheters, you know, and the only difference in this catheter is it has a spiked end versus a wider diameter or smaller diameter. So it's not always required if it's an exact copy. That comes under the discretion of the FDA and the reviewers that you'll deal with. And again, you want experienced people, you want to bring in your lawyers and your consultants because you want somebody who can talk to the reviewers in their language for you, um, you know, and convince them, you know, uh, that you should be approved under a 510K. You don't need to be a PMA or a de novo product. So again, there's a lot of discretion in that, uh, that piece of it. So I'll move on to the next slide. And in the next slide, we're talking about um, medical device versus general wellness. Okay, I wear a smartwatch on my arm. Uh, this watch will tell me my heart rate. It will tell me how many steps I take. It will tell me how fast I'm running. It will tell me how many calories I burn. And because it's telling me, and it's for my general health and wellness, the FDA chooses not to regulate this app or this smartwatch and its apps, okay? And so that's an important point because this same smartwatch with these same apps, if a doctor put this on me, read the results and used them to diagnose, treat, or um, manage a disease that I had, now it becomes a regulated medical device. It's that simple. If a doctor or a healthcare provider is using the information to treat, mitigate, uh, cure, diagnose, you have a medical device. And you can see on the screen in front of you that, um, you know, and, and they, this comes straight from the, um, from the regulations and from uh, the definition of the medical device, instrument, apparatus, implement, machine, contrivance, implant, in vitro reagent. We didn't have that many. Um, we didn't have that many um, uh, nouns and modifiers previously. But as we keep inventing things, the list gets longer. So um, one of the things is that uh, you know that's when it becomes a medical device. It's by intent, by function. Adam, you've reappeared. I have reappeared because you're stimulating a lot of thoughts from people, which is great. And That's I think wonderful. the next one is, as we, as you've touched on medical device, and I think we're going to touch on digital health too. So if I've jumped the gun, just let me know. But for those in the digital health space where things seem to move quickly, if people are sort of done their homework and determined that they can't seem to find a predicate digital health app for what they're trying to do, does that force them into the de novo space or is there a way in which they can do some sort of abbreviated filing? Sometimes you can use a combination of, of products in, in a 510K. Um, that used to happen frequently. The agency cracked down on it. They're more about one-on-one -on -one products. If you use a combination of products, you may have to do some safety and efficacy testing, some clinical work. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, 
that would be a way that you could um, that would be a way that you could shorten it. And again, there's a lot of discretion and you'll see when I go further down in the slides that basically this is all new to FDA as well as everybody else. I mean, 2014, Bakul Patel showed up and they gave Patel, uh, Bakul an office and they said, Bakul, uh, we need a digital arm. And so Bakul started the digital arm. And I have some slides, which I call Bakul's pyramid of you know what he regulated at the time and what they're regulating now and the interesting part is actually we can probably jump to some of that one right now if i can quickly find it there it is can everybody see the pyramid on their screen okay we first started years and years and years ago in 2014 and even before that i think it was before 2014 but this is the first uh, presentation I could see it in. FDA decided that, you know, we actually regulate about two to 3% of the medical of the apps. And we're calling those medical apps. And the mobile medical apps, you know, at the time, were pretty much hooked up to telemetry and different things in the hospital to monitor patients. They weren't really, um, they weren't really consumer apps. But as the smartphone grew and the smartwatch and all of those things took hold, what happened is um, you then see in the next slide that regulated got a whole lot bigger, mobile apps and general wellness got a whole lot bigger, and there's a gray area that's a lot greater in between. So, you know, one of the things that you're talking about um, is that FDA's influence keeps growing in this, okay? And again, it's a very, very complex regulatory scheme. And, you know, pharmaceutical small molecules have been around forever. The scheme, everybody has it down. Biologics are something new and they're learning a lot. And, you know, stem cell therapies and all these things are now getting new regulations, new pathways because they don't fit into the old pathways. And medical devices, because of the advance of technology and the whole mobile medical apps and software that has been, medical software that's been put out there, is also in flux a lot. I do want to call your attention to one thing on this slide, and it talks about national formulas and pharmacopoeias. There actually are non-mechanical um, medical devices. For instance, traditional laxatives are a medical device. Um, there are also barrier products, creams that will go on your arm and protect the wound um, or go beneath the surface to protect your arm from chemical exposure or um, you know, bacteria getting in. Those are actually medical devices, even though they come in a cream form or a topical form. So, you know, and then we get into areas where nobody's sure yet. You swallow a pill which then um, takes a look at, um, you know, the inner insides of your, of your body. And, you know, is a pill that goes down and takes pictures of your stomach lining, is that, um, and, you know, reports it back. Is that a device? Uh, is that a combination product? There's something called combination products, which are um, either pharmaceuticals and biologics combined with a medical device, okay? A pre-filled syringe is technically a combination product. Adam? We're starting to get a bunch of questions on the voluntary Q submission program and the best way to engage in FDA regarding that. And I know it's not on this slide, but since we've gotten a couple questions on it, I figured I'd lob it out there and you could put your thoughts in on that also. Voluntary Q is an excellent idea. And the reason voluntary queue is an excellent idea is because it gets you in front of the FDA before you're officially in front of the FDA. But don't be fooled because anytime you're in front of the FDA, you're in front of the FDA and what you say and the data you present count. So while the voluntary queue is a, is a very good program and I highly encourage it in certain circumstances, um, actually a wide array of circumstances, it's not for every product. And again, that's a discretionary call you're gonna need veteran lawyers and veteran consultants to make, okay? 
So without getting too deep into the whole thing, uh, because again, that's a whole hour lecture in itself, um, you know, it's a good idea to get in front of the FDA in a, um, in a pre-FDA manner, so to speak. So that's, that's, that's an interesting, uh, interesting question. Okay. Um, well, taking a look back, 1976 medical device amendments, and you have three classes, class one, class two, class three, okay? And obviously your strategy is look for the lower risk products with predicate devices for 510Ks. Realistically, if you're gonna get into the tongue depressor or toothbrush business, which are class one devices, then you need to, you know, realize you're going to be in crowded markets, and a lot of that is going to be subject to your promotion and investment. Class two is generally where you want to be in, a, in the intermediate risk. And the reason for that is you want to be able to use a 510k, get the product on the market, and then using that real world data that you have out there, if you collect it in a controlled manner, FDA has become much more friendly to it you can perhaps do a smaller clinical trial for something that's not part of the 510K. So if you're approved for a 510K and the device basically examines your little finger, then you can examine your thumb as well. So if you wanna go from the little finger to the thumb, you basically have to run more tests and testing and a shortcut to that while you're gaining revenues is to use real world data or real world evidence. So if you're a younger company and a newer company and you wanna come up in class two, that's a good place to be. Even a de novo in class two is much less than your class one. Class three devices, what can I say? They're devices out of places like Medtronics. They're extremely complex. And you may produce some out of the Roseman Institute um, that is going to be subject to a very much higher level of scrutiny. You're not at intermediate controls anymore. You're at a higher level of controls in developing it, manufacturing it, and um, the product and everything else. So class three is a lot for a new company to take on. It can be done. And certainly if you have a novel idea that's really good, um, you know, then that is you know, a place you want to go, but you really have to have a novel idea and a new product. Um, otherwise, you're competing with the implantables and things from other um, large companies that, um, you know, may be tough to compete with. Um, again, the point I'm going to make is function. And I think I went over this previously, your smartwatch and aerobics, fitness, etc. Whereas that same heart rate monitor with the same mechanism of action, okay, using the same pulses or the same vibration or the same measurement in some way or another, uh, and it's being used for diagnosis, treatment, and mitigation of disease, now you're at a regulated medical device. So general rule of thumb, if a doctor or healthcare professional is using the data to treat the patient or make decisions about the patient, it's generally going to be a medical device. Okay. Um, okay, why is this important? Because Medufa, and that's a whole nother subject, will, whoops, I think we have a question first. Go ahead, Adam. No, not to cut you off. Uh, and this one has to do with a breakthrough designation. And if you get that, is there still potentially a requirement that you'd have to do a de novo next? Well, the breakthrough, the breakthrough designation doesn't change your pathway. It just accelerates it. And so if you were on track for de novo, you're still doing a de novo. It you're still doing a de novo or you're still doing a PMA because it's you still need the same authorization or approval. Mm -hmm. They're just making it faster. They're simplifying yeah. the rules for you. They're saying this is an unmet medical need. This is a unique situation, a unique device. We need this out there. There's nothing that's treating them. They're using devices off label, but that's not what we want as the FDA. We want the approved device. And so what they're doing is they're saying, we're gonna, you know, instead of taking 18 to 24 months, we're gonna tell you, you can do a smaller clinical trial. You can do more post-approval observation. 
um, to make up for the data you didn't get and pre-approval observation. And we're gonna push this through the system a lot faster. We're gonna reduce your requirements and streamline the process. So it doesn't change your pathway. It simply changes your, your process, uh, streamlines the process. And does device classification have any impact on insurance reimbursements? Sure. I mean, you know, everything has it on insurance reimbursements. Um, not exactly my field, but I do do some work, at, you know, with CMS uh, and some of the private insurers from time to time, as far as the technical side of it, the FDA side of it, um, which then goes to CMS. So, uh, obviously, if you have a tongue depressor in a class one, you know, your pricing is going to be uh, very, very different in a competitive market like that than, you know, what they're going to, what CMS, who generally sets a lot of the price for the world, is going to pay you for that versus if you have a very complex type of monitor or machine that does something very different. I had one. Um, where a very, uh, very well-known uh, research institute, um, you know, very much like Roseman, one of the large treating hospitals. And what they did was they had created a monitor that there was a particular piece of machine and the resolution, you can only get to a certain point. The manufacturer didn't go past that point. So they created a back end device that actually took the resolution to a greater extent so that their doctors could look for something in pediatrics that you wouldn't necessarily see in the resolution for adults. So in something like that, obviously your reimbursement is going to be higher. Some of the interesting ones are really like inhalers, okay? So you take inhalers like this one and you know, this part of it in here, you know, you're looking at a pharmaceutical perhaps, but this part and this part, you're looking at a device. And depending how you file that, okay, depending how you file that, whether you file it as a pharmaceutical, as an uh, NDA, or whether you file it as a device, okay, as a PMA, or a 510K is going to determine your reimbursement. Excellent. And you've definitely stimulated something on the breakthrough side. So we've got two sort of companion questions here, which is, can breakthrough tech be used as a predicate for a 510k? And then the opposite, which is, is 510k off the table if you get breakthrough? Well, if you get breakthrough through, you want it because that means that you have a, um, you know, you have the better device, it's gonna get the better pricing, it's gonna get the quicker approval and you're gonna get more protections. Um, you know, the 510K, you're gonna be a Me Too device or you're gonna be categorized as a Me Too device. So it's, it's a big distinction. The first question, I'm not sure I understood. Could you repeat that one, Adam, please? Oh yeah, that, the, the first one was around the concept that if you, can you use breakthrough technology as a predicate? in the context of applying for a 510K. I think it's I think it's men in the context of if someone else gets a breakthrough designation, does that count as something for which can be determined as a predicate for the next Well, person? once the device is authorized or approved, then obviously, you know, you look at it as a predicate, but the question becomes the device is also protected. So it may not be available. And if you have a breakthrough device and it's that unique and novel and treating an unmet medical need, um, I'm sure that you're between FDA exclusivity and between your patents and IP, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure it's gonna be hard to use that one as a predicate. Yeah. Yeah. That's, Great. Uh, you know, and can you piggyback on that information? Not until it's filed and approved. So that's one of the key things. If something's published, that's one thing. But generally, you know, the FDA, not generally, the FDA has to keep secret what you're filing with the FDA. The only thing that goes out in public is the press releases or what you put out, especially if you're a public company and you want to stimulate, you know, share price and show investors that you have a future or whatever. But the FDA can never release any of that information. So that's all private information until it's approved. And then they put out the approval packet 
which is a, granted it's redacted significantly, your trade secrets and your other things are protected, but it's enough information that if you needed to piggyback, that would be where you would go for that information. Excellent. All right, carry on. All right, so moving down, um, enforcement discretion. This is an important thing. And, uh, you know, it's very amorphous and it depends the regime that's in. Some commissioners have much less discretion. They allow much less discretion. Some commissioners allow much more discretion. Um, you know, um, it, it just depends on who's in the top seat and which administration they're answering to as an agency and where publicity is and where Congress is as to how much discretion is going to be granted. So, you know, I mean, they can um, refrain from, you know, um, they can use discretion again, you know, breakthrough to make, you know, make things faster and in, in uh, pre-market. They can um, overlook things if you agree to fix them in quality systems. It's your manufacturing of the product. Uh, they can say certain applications they're not going to deal with. A prime example in the test area was LDTs or laboratory developed tests. And this was interesting because the LDTs, as long as you're developing a test and the company is using it in house or the hospital is using it in inside uh, the premises and those results are staying inside the institution, you know, it's a proprietary thing and goes to the doctor, but you're not marketing the kit, then you are an LDT and you're regulated by CLIA, the CLIA labs, C-L-I-A. However, if you take that test and you spin it off into an independent kit, very much what we saw in COVID testing, and you sell that kit, then you are going to be subject to device requirements and you have to go through the process to get it approved. Um, FDA in that case made a discretionary call and said, we're gonna describe, we're gonna put out a policy document called a guidance. We're gonna tell you that you need 30 pa positive patients, 30 negative patients, unless, and then there was some statistical work that they talked about, but in general, and then if that works out for you and you file properly, we're going to grant you an EUA, an emergency use authorization. They have the discretion to do that. I have to say in my 30 years in this business, I probably saw EUA used two or three times prior to COVID. Now it's become kind of a standard thing that we're doing in pandemic um, medicine. But prior to that, it was a very, very rare type of uh, approval. So, you know, your strategy there is obtain as much discretion as you can. Okay, we're back to talking about um, devices and software and medical apps, okay? And so, as I said before, FDA regulates products based on their function, okay? The same product used in two different ways. One can be, hence, if you remember the example of the smartwatch, one can be regulated and one cannot be regulated. It's the same thing with software. If you have software that say, I had a client um, years ago who had invented a conduit, so to speak, created software that took the, um, the information from the approved device and sent it to the back end where it was analyzed. Okay, that did not require being a medical device because it was acting as a conduit. However, when they improved it and they decided to do data analytics from that information from the device before it went to the back end, it became a medical device. So software is the same. Um, you know, that's that's a big part of it. Uh, I have to say this that the FDA does not really know what to do with software fully yet or medical apps. They're getting there. There are large gray areas. It's kind of a mystery under the current regulations. And so you're going in with a, you know, an informed message with, um, with people who can, um, what do I want to say? With people who understand what the FDA is looking for um, to gain a certain categorization 
is always going to be helpful for you. Okay. Software and medical apps are just starting, the regulations are just starting to catch up with what's going on. The law lags a little bit behind. So much of the software goes into an unregulated gray area. So you want to work towards demonstrating to the FDA that your software is at the least level of regulation. Okay. Unless for other reasons, you want to present it as a very complex piece in protection and, and uh, marketing and sales. But generally, if you're in the market, you want to be able to get it to market with the least regulation and start generating revenues. Okay. Now we're going to talk a little bit about, and we've talked a lot about this with questions because they've been excellent questions. Um, FDA's intersection with mHealth the perspective for mobile medical applications and clinical decision support software. Okay, so FDA intends to apply its regulatory oversight to only those software functions that are medical devices and whose functionality could pose a risk to patient safety if the device were not functioning. Those monitors, the software that runs those monitors in the ICU, in the surgical suite, the operating room, those are obviously things that they want to regulate. Now, um, other things that remind people to, you know, maybe at the nurse's station, they have bells that remind them for medication times. Maybe they have other software that reminds them of certain patient checks, things like that. Those are not going to be um, regulated generally, okay? And um, we'll go a little bit further into that. Um, mobile apps, the way to look at it is if you take this smartwatch and it, the software transforms it, the app transforms it into something that allows doctors to use that information to treat you, diagnose you, um, manage your disease, then you have a device. And that's the difference between the medical, the mobile medical app and just the plain mobile app. Adam. I mean, it's, it's amazing because it's sort of right on topic for one of these questions that relates to um, machine learning software that's for a decision support tool. Does FDA look at that the same way we're talking about these mobile medical apps or does that fall into a separate sort of bucket? Well, we're going to discuss clinical decision software in a minute, but um, jump the let gun. me go there. there go. Let me jump the gun <laughs> and go there. Um, let's see, here it is. Okay, so you can see in your clinical decision software, okay, CDS as they call it in the jargon of the industry. Um, for some reason, we're an industry that loves jargon and the FDA loves acronyms. So it's probably typical of a government agency. But um, anyway, um, the clinical decision software is judged by providing professionals and patients with knowledge and person-specific person information. So you're intelligently filtering or presenting at the appropriate time certain information. So you get a whole screen of data. You get many data points, but only three are important to what you're doing. The AI or the software filters out those three points. Yes, that's definitely a decision software that's definitely regulated, okay? Now, you know, um, computerized alerts, reminders for providers, um, um, clinical guidelines, uh, order sets, patient data reports and summaries. Those are not necessarily um, what we would call a, uh, what do I wanna say? They're not necessarily the regulated CDS. So um, I hope that answers the question, Adam. Um, I kind of lost track of the question halfway through, but I think that's nope, what they're asking. It. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So uh, clinical decision software. Okay. Software. Okay. Is if it's intended to acquire, process, or analyze, or, you know, and, and I think the same is true with AI, although the rules are still in flux on AI, but in the, the um, products I've been called on that use AI, the FDA has still been looking at it as acquire, process, or analyze, okay? If it does that, you know, then you have a device. Displaying, analyzing, print, 
printing medical information, supporting or providing recommendations, okay, you're all in um, clinical decision software, okay. And so uh, let me see if I've missed anything because, oh, here we go. This I think is uh, an important point. Uh, and this goes further to it. If you have educational tools, software or medical mobile apps uh, for medical training, then you know when you're educating doctors, that's not um, decision software. We have general patient education and access to commonly used reference uh, organization, uh, reference information. So you would want um, uh, you would want the patient to know certain things about the, how to take their, um, how to use the product, really. The detailed instructions or how to use the product, not necessarily um, a CDS. You're automating general office operations, meaning that, you know, you're categorizing patients, sorting them, alphabetizing them, whatever. That's not necessarily going to fall into that. And general purpose products. Um, you know, uh, which is pretty much everything that falls outside of what we defined. And bringing it back, we can see that mobile apps are software programs, you know, that run on communications devices of various types, and they can be accessories that attach to that. So your smartphone may not necessarily, or your, your um, iPhone may not necessarily be a uh, medical device. However, when I take that iPhone and I put an attachment on it that detects whether your uh, mole on someone is cancerous, then it becomes a medical device. And then there's Bluetooth regulations as to how it's transmitted, uh, secure Bluetooth regulations, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, that's the difference. Mobile apps don't transform the phone into a medical device. Mobile medical apps, um, really meet the definition of a medical device, even in its, uh, you know, the definition of medical device in its broadest sense, um, historically, you know, has always been anything that's not metabolized that treats, diagnoses, mitigates, manages a disease. So that's pretty much where we've uh, gone with that. A um, couple things I want to mention to you just so you're aware of it. Adulteration um, and misbranding. Okay, adulteration, if you don't file the correct thing, if you say that you're a class one and you're not filing a 510K, the FDA thinks otherwise you have an adulterated device. Um, if you didn't gather the data under an IDE, okay, or an investigational advice uh, exemption, which is for your clinical trial pretty much, then that um, data is not allowed to be used, that evidence is not allowed to be used, your adulterated device. If you miss a piece of documentation on step three in your process, but you still produce a perfect medical device, it's adulterated because your documentation was faulty. Okay, so that's what you need to know on that. The difference between that and misbranding, and the reason I always bring it up, people call me and say, my device left the factory perfect, the FDA is saying it's misbranded. The device can leave the factory perfect. You can put out an ad with a claim for the device that's not been approved, okay? It's not part of the 510K, it's not part of the PMA, it wasn't included in the clinical trials, and you have misbranded the product just by putting out that ad, okay? So, and some of the common things are people put labels on them. It'll be manufactured by one company, marketed by another, and they won't put the primary company, and it can be either company, but they won't put the company that answers the 800 number with the medical personnel. They forget to put that information on there, or it's obscured, or they put the wrong company's information on there, okay? Adequate directions of use, I can't go over that enough. In medical devices, that's everything. So you really have to um, make sure that your directions are adequate uh, and filed with the FDA. The FDA is not gonna necessarily, I mean, they'll overlook your directions, you know, and, and you know, they'll, they'll say, okay, if that's the way you're telling us it works, that's fine. But 
if they start getting complaints that your device isn't working and it turns out that it's due to your directions, you've misbranded your product. Um, advertising is the place where you generally misbrand a product. Adulteration generally happens in your production of the product um, or the claims you make. And the FDA always tosses on one additional claim, and that is either adulteration or misbranding in interstate commerce, because it's a very easy claim to make. They get to uh, double up on you by, by proving one claim, they prove the other. Neil, we've got a question. I think it's interesting. I'm going to read it verbatim because it's definitely a little outside of my depth. The question is, does it matter to the FDA how the user interacts with the CDS? Example, upstream processes set up as long as the CDS achieves the intended function, such as a clinical decision support with AI generated visual ways. And the example is, it relates to a variety of user experiences for triggering a CDS result. So clearly in the software space. And I think it's sort of, how is, how is FDA interacting with this? It definitely makes a difference. And the question is, who is the interactive user? Is the interactive user the medical professional? Is it the patient? Is it uh, an intermediary of some type? Are you screening? So in other words, is there, uh, is your CDS acting as a screening tool? Um, you know, if you, perhaps they're talking about, the only thing I can think of off the top of my head is, you know, you're putting in your medical history perhaps into the, into the CDS and they ask you a question of, you know, um, do you have a heart condition or do you have high blood pressure? Do you have diabetes? Um, you know, and it's going to take you in a different track for its recommendations to diagnose, treat, or recommend, then yeah, that's, that's going to affect it as well. And it also depends who the user is. That's a big part of it. That's a great point. Um, does FDA consider clinical evidence from studies that are conducted outside the United States to support clearance of a device? Well, technically, the answer is they will, but in practicality, um, I think we've just seen in the newspaper several times, certainly Chinese data um, for major well-known companies, I think it was Lilly and one of the others was not accepted. Uh, generally, it's hardest to get the least regulated countries data in. Um, China and India would be very tough data to get the FDA to accept. Uh, Europe, it's kind of interesting because you would think Canada would have a reciprocal with the United States. They don't. We have a memorandum of understanding, but Canada is completely reciprocal with EU. So sometimes devices come in through Canada and with our memorandum of understanding, some of that EU data will come in in a lot of ways. But, you know, I had a company not too long ago that had a product and they did one study in the U.S., and one study in Europe. The European study did not work out, granted, but the FDA wanted a second study done in the US. Um, now, had the European study been um, successful, would they have accepted some of that data? Probably. And, you know, they might have said, well, you have to do a second study in the US, but it can be much smaller. So it's really discretionary as to what they accept. There's no rule against accepting it. But in practicality, um, if you want a product in the US, you're gonna need to market it in the US. You know, one of the things I always run into this question is with Australian companies, because the Australian Health Authority is much, is also about price and is also much more lenient. So if you invent a device that, you know, relieves pain, but it doesn't show any particular regression in the disease or preservation of the joint or whatever you're doing, the FDA is not necessarily going to approve that device. So, you know, the FDA runs on data and a lot of foreign companies that I represent get in trouble because EU, uh, especially Australia, but EU to a large extent, if you have the right professors and thought leaders and scientists behind your product, you get a lot of discretion and leeway. In the FDA, you know, you can bring in anybody you want, and they'll be treated politely. But if they don't bring the data with them, you're not going anywhere. 
So I caution companies because it happens with foreign companies all the time because they work on a different system. But with FDA, data is king, always will be, and it's all about the data. I think you're getting people starting to think about resources. And there's a couple questions here that sort of relate to ways of figuring things out, such as are there databases that can be accessed to figure out the classification for your device? Or if, is the, if you need FDA support, is the, best way to, is the best way to do that by contacting someone at FDA to get guidance or to be using sort of a private company approach, whether it's a law firm, consultant, uh, service provider, generally that touts FDA experience? You know, obviously my opinion is going to be, you know, considered somewhat biased because of where I sit. But quite honestly, even when I sat at Pfizer and some of the large companies I sat at, um, we did not go to the FDA until we were ready to go to the FDA. You know, you wouldn't try out your new play on game day. You know, you try it out in practice. And it's the same thing here. You're going to want to get the advice up front. Uh, I'll give you an example. Some years ago, I had an upstart company. They had a really good idea. Um, their medical director um, was convinced by someone who was a retired FDA person that, um, that this consultant could handle it. Uh, and it turns out that the consultant was really an inspector was not, which is, you know, a very good thing, but I mean, it was, she wasn't at the high levels of the FDA. Uh, consequently, um, you know, they decided that they would use this consultant and then go into the FDA with these questions. Long story short, the general counsel who I knew well a year later was calling me up asking him if I could get him a job because the company had gone out of business. So advice up front. I mean, I know everybody wants to take a shortcut and whatever, but we certainly work with people that, you know, have limited resources and things to the extent we can. I think there's a lot of, um, I think there's some companies out there that will. And, uh, you know, you always want to have your ducks in a row, as they say, before you go into the FDA. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, we just got a question in the chat. Uh, do you need an IDE for collecting data on a de novo product or only for PMA devices? You always need an IDE. Whenever you're going to collect data clinically, you need an IDE. Whenever you're going to collect human data, you need an IDE. Now, if you're a de novo because you're not quite the same as a 510K and the FDA is not going to require clinical work, then, you know, you can collect data, bench data, so to speak, for everybody who was a scientist out there. You know, you can collect bench data without an IDE. But if you're going to collect data from humans, you're going to use a device on humans. It needs to have an IDE. That's why one of the good things to do is if you can test it out as a wellness product, use the data, uh, you know, call the function or intention that the person can, you know, use the data themselves rather than it going to the healthcare professional to mitigate diagnose or function, then I think, you know, that's a good way to go because you can generate revenues so that you can open an IDE so that you can collect the data and support it with real world evidence. I see Christine has come back to the screen, I know. so I'll take I feel it. Like our I'm time the, is up. I feel like I'm the party pooper here. I just want <laughs> to let you know the time is up. Thank you for everybody for uh, your question. Uh, thank you, Neil, once again, amazing uh, presentation and your insight. Uh, and uh, Adam, thanks for fielding all the questions. Our pleasure. And I know we didn't get to answer all of the questions. There were a lot of questions. I can honestly say in all of our talks, these are the most. That's why Neil's put his information here. Happy to have follow up for everything. Please email us or, you know, give us a call or whatever you can do. Uh, an email usually works pretty well. And um, Adam and I will take a look at your emails and get back to you to the best of our ability. So please do. Um, please do email us uh, with further questions because as Adam said, we couldn't get to them all today. So I thank you for being such a great audience and providing so many questions. Thank That's you, great. Christine. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. And thanks to the Roseman Institute for having me. Thank us. you.